It's uh, such an honor to be here. And I love Vancouver in so many ways. Actually, the first time that I came to Vancouver, I was a late teenager. Vancouver, and Vancouver is very special because Vancouver hosted the World Conference on Human Settlements. And that's where UN Habitat was created at the time Pierre Trudeau was the prime minister. And by coincidence, my father was Under Secretary General of the UN in charge of the conference in Vancouver. And somehow I, I learned a lot. He visited over 95% of the countries, inviting them to Vancouver. And also while I was in Vancouver, one of my brothers also came. And for everyone that is here that you are not from Vancouver, you might be bitten by urbanism and by creating cities and nature. Because following the conference, my brother that was here with me, he ended up being mayor of Bogota twice. He's the current mayor of Bogota. And I've been working over 25 years in cities. And I've been working in more than 250 different cities. So UN Habitat and Vancouver and BC have a very close to my heart. And part of it maybe is how I ended up in Bogota because in my previous life, now I lived in Toronto, but before immigrating to Toronto, I was commissioner in Bogota. And one of the things, obviously, Bogota is not the ideal city. It's decades behind Vancouver. But I learned something as commissioner, that transforming cities and creating a city for nature and the connection of children and nature is not about the money. Also, I've been doing, now I advise many cities, but before that, I was doing, for example, in the first time we built over 200 parks. In the next one, another 600 parks. We built parks all over the city. This was just one of them. The Simon Bolivar <laughs> Park, the Pope came here, gave a mass for a million people, and then the Pope left and nothing happened. Why nothing happened for almost 27 years? Because change is hard. So when we are creating a movement of nature, we must keep in mind, change is hard. Doing more of the same is easier. Because when you try to change, the civic cadavers show up. <laughs> Who are the civic cadavers? People that you thought they were dead because they haven't done anything good for the community, but when you try to do, they resuscitate. <laughs> <laughs> but every one of us knows that we are there is to get things done. Not to find 20 excuses why things cannot be done. So nothing happened in 27 years, and in four years, we turned it into the nicest part for passive, for active, for contemplative recreation. And this was one of them. It's not just about active, but it's also contemplative, and it's also passive. It's, it's a combination of all of it. It's also about having small ones and big ones and, uh, all over the place. It's also having a nice distribution and making the water that is kind of magical and it's so fantastic. So the parts are great. The other, the other thing that I want to mention about Bogota is that we did something called Ciclovia that in North America we call it open streets. What is it? We created the world's largest pop-up park. <laughs> Sunday mornings we pop it, up, pop it up and people come up and it's kind of like magic. All of the colors are the different income levels. We included the poorest neighbors and the wealthy neighbors. How do you do it? You open streets to people, closing to cars and the magic happens. Young and old and rich and poor and fat and skinny, everybody goes. And along the way, connecting with nature in the parks, we do aerobics and tai chi and cha cha cha. <laughs> Anything related to physical activity. And people come out and they enjoy it. And more than anything, people enjoy being with each other. Who comes? Everybody. All you really need is two feet and a heartbeat, and you're there and you're happy. Young, old, rich, poor. Over one and a half million people every Sunday. And when it's nice and sunny, it might be two million people. Every Sunday of the year plus holidays, it changes minds. All of a sudden, it reminds people that the streets are one third of our city. And the streets are public spaces. They belong to all of us. It's not just to move cars. The streets have been around thousands of years before the cars even existed. And this works in cities of small 10,000 people, 100,000, 10 million, 20 million. And it's wonderful because it's also about social integration. And more than social integration, it's a place where we meet each other as equals. Actually, it's the only place that in Bogota and in most cities where I see the program, people meet each other as equals. And that is critical to create a community. It might be the owners of the largest corporation and their minimum wage workers with their 
spouses and families doing exactly the same activity as equals. And we interconnected all of the main metropolitan parks so that they can use the streets to get connected with nature. But now, I run two organizations, 88 cities and World Urban Parks. And if anybody has comments, tweet them too. And let me know anything that you like, don't like. And, and what are the World Urban Parks and 880 cities? What is World Urban Parks? Basically, I hope that many of you become members. And I love that we are collaborating with children and nature. Because it's about how to have quality urban parks for everybody, everywhere. And if you want any more information, you can go to the website, waterrunparks.org. We have, we created a brand new committee to make in sync with this conference, which is children play and nature. But everywhere I go, people say, Gil, what's 880 cities? Well, 880 cities is not really about parks or streets or walking and cycling. Those are the means, not the end. The end is how to create successful cities and vibrant cities where people are going to be happier. And when I'm in any city, people say, oh, can I send my children walking across that intersection to go to the park? Can they buy to get eggs or milk? I said, look, you don't have to be a transportation engineer. Three simple steps. We call it the 880 rule of common sense. Unfortunately, common sense seems to be the least common of the senses. <laughs> Step number one, think about a child that you love, your son, your daughter, your grandkid. Once you have that child in mind, step number two, think about an 80-year-old that you love, your parents, your grandparents, your brothers, your sisters. And when you have the child and the older adult in mind, go to step number three. Would you send them walking to school? Would you send them walking across the intersection, biking to the park? That connectivity with nature, would they feel safe? If you would, it's because it's safe enough. If you would not, it's because it's not. And we gotta do it better. What if everything that we did in your city, in Vancouver or any other city, had to be great for an eight and an 80? It's not eight to 80, it's eight and 80 as an indicator species. Because if it's good for the eight and the 80, it's gonna be good for everybody. From zero to over 100, we need to stop building cities as if everybody was 30 year old and athletic, and we gotta create great cities for all. Cities. And we're talking about cities. Why cities? Today we got 3.5 billion people living in cities. And in the lifetime of children, in the lifetime, we're talking about children and nature. In the lifetime of the children today, we're going to go to 7.2 billion. We're going to double the population living in cities. And everywhere the cities are growing. In the U.S., in this time, it's going to go by over 100 million people. So in the U.S. we're going to have to build about 40 million homes in the next 40 years. And it's all urban growth because that is where the population growth is going to. In Canada, Canada we're going to grow by over 7 million people in the next 30 years. That is like doing 10 Vancouver's in 30 years. I wish it would be as nice as Vancouver. Unfortunately, it's not, well, that's not how we are growing. Seven million people is the same as the population in our five largest cities. It's like doing a Toronto, Montreal, Calgary, Ottawa, and Edmonton in 30 years. Most of our large cities are going to grow more than 50%. Imagine if we had a magic wand and we could redo half of our city, even the best half, we would do it even better. Well, that's the opportunity that we have. How are we going to do it? The government of Ontario put around Toronto a green belt saying no one can grow beyond this. And it's not that people are living in the rural areas. The rural population is pretty much the same. Actually, it's grown a little bit. But it's just the growth of the population that has gone to the cities. In the US and Canada, almost 9 out of 10 people live in cities. So we need to improve the cities that we have today. But we also got to create great cities for many, many, many people. And when we talk about population, and this growth, the good news is that the, the, the red line is the growth, the percentage, is that we are not growing anymore. The, it peaked about 40 years ago, and now it's decreasing. But since there are so many more children and youth, it's going to continue to grow for another 40, 50, 60 years. And when we talk about growth of population, some people blame the cities, all oh, those cities. No, the cities have nothing to do with the population growth. The cities is not about the what, but as we are going to grow within the lifetime of our children from 3.5 billion to 7 billion, cities do on the how, on the how. How are we going to build the cities? And this is totally in sync with nature. 
because we can grow the cities in many different ways. We can have either just one gigantic building or lots of smaller ways. This is one, it's three, three ways of having density. This is other ways of having density. Ten different ways of having exactly the same amount of people. We can have a 40-story building every other block, or we can have five-story buildings next to each other. And this is all about sustainability. Some people say, oh, we don't want buildings. Well, the reality is that we can have a building or we can have this. What, what is going to be more efficient? These 10 different ways of density or this? Because imagine just bringing the water and the sewage and the transportation and work and schools and everything to this. And we are not doing a very good job. Two days ago when I flew out of Toronto, coming here, this is what the suburbs of Toronto look like today. Totally unsustainable. So this is very concerning when we say that Toronto is going to grow by over 50% in the next 30 years. So how do we want to live? So remember I mentioned about 40 years ago, Vancouver hosted UN Habitat. So if I'm thinking what are we going to do in the next 40, maybe we should look also what have we done in the last 40 to see if that's what we should be doing in the next 40. And there are some big concerns. Well, these eight guys <laughs> have more money than half of the people around the world. So the issue of equity is something that is critical. In many places all over the world, how we are sending the poor people to the worst places, whether it's Brazil or it's the Philippines or South Africa. And of course, in North America, it's not that we have to build cities much better than that. We've been building cities thinking more on car mobility than on people's happiness. Is this what we call cities for people? Not likely. Is this what we're going to be doing? Are we going to do cities where if you are happen to be born in one part of the city, you're going to live half the life or you're going to live 50% more? If you live in the north side of one city, you're going to have five times more parks and green spaces than if you are born in another part of the city. So it's clear that it's not just in the developing countries. The CDC says that six out of ten people in the U.S. do not have a park within walking distance. That's half a mile. Other people have said that it's even in the cities where it would be easier Less than between 35 and 50 percent do not have a park within a walking distance. That's half a mile. So that's how we've been doing in the last 40 years. So it's very clear that we have not done a good job in the last 40 years. So what are we going to do in the next 40 years? We have a fantastic opportunity, but more than opportunity, it's a wonderful responsibility, enormous responsibility, because the population is going to level up. So whatever we do or don't do in the next 40 years is how billions of people are going to live for hundreds and hundreds of years. So I want to invite each one of you to become a guardian angel. I want you to become a guardian angel of the gentle majority. What do I mean by gentle majority? I mean children, all their adults, the poor. And when I say gentle, I say gentle as opposed to squeaky wheels. They are not the loudest. When you have public meetings, the children are doing homework, hopefully playing. The poor have two and three jobs, they're not gonna be there. So we need to get the children, we need to connect children with nature. The beauty is that if we make connect children and nature, the reality is we're connecting everyone with nature. Their parents, their grandparents, everybody. So the children can be a common denominator. So as an example, why don't we have playability? In Vancouver and every city, playability. Where with the children were walking down the sidewalk and they can go and swim. We're gonna go and take the bus and then we can stop at a parklet. Play is critical, and it's not an issue of money, this is not expensive, it's more about creativity. So play is absolutely critical. It's not just because it's fun and games, and it's lots of fun and games to play, but it's also because that is how children learn, how children develop their muscle strength, and their creativity, and their cognitive thinking, and the capacity to learn languages, to, to socialize, to develop friendships for life, to develop a sense of belonging to their community, so we should have a goal in Vancouver and everywhere. Every child should have a park or a play area with nature within 500 meters, less than half a mile by 2020. Let's start building parks all over the place. 
And we can do it. We can make that connection. Not in 50 years, now, in the next 40 years. I mean, in the next 40 years, by 2020. Everywhere. And some people might say, but what if in a neighborhood we don't have a park? Okay, if we don't have a park, or a place for a park, let's take what belongs to all of us. The schools, the, the libraries, the street, the sidewalk. And you know, they did this in New York in the last seven years of Bloomberg. They found there were many people that did not have a park with walking distance. So they went to the schools and they said, look, you got this horrible pavement that you call playground. We'll make it a nice playground if and only if you make it a school park. And this is what they do. Look at those green spaces, beautiful trees and green roofs and so on. Why are the green so important? Because playing in green cities reduces the attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. And it wasn't just one or two. New York increased by 31% the playgrounds without buying one inch of land. And if we don't have a school, we can have a street. The streets are one third of our city. Let's take some of them and make it a play street. But we gotta have play areas and connection with nature. Now, everywhere. So what ball are we going to play? And when we're talking about children, I always remember when I was having dinner with Rich Love. By the way, let's give him a big hand. <laughs> so we have learned so much from you. And you have been a, such a fantastic inspiration. He said, Gil, when I was talking about older adults, he said, you know, Gil, the, the, the boomers, the boomers might be the last generation that still remembers of playing on the streets. That the streets used to be a reward. If you do your homework, you can go out on the street. <laughs> it used to be a reward. The contact with nature, the way would go to the parks. And he said, this is a living memory. And if we don't, do a, if we don't make the connection of boomers and children, that living, that living memory is gonna die. And people might not even remember that we used to just go around the parks and go out on the streets and play with the trees. So this impacted me, this, his comment very much. And I said, you know, we're living longer. Not longer, much, much, much longer. You know the people that have ever lived to 65, ever lived in the history of humanity, half are alive today. This is quite nice. And people are not going into retirement, People are more into rehirement. <laughs> People want to do other things. They're hungry to learn about activities, gardening, and cooking, and philosophy, and all kinds. So this rehirement, how are we going to take advantage? We have double our life expectancy. We have really learned how to survive. But when we got all of these issues of climate change, and poverty, health crisis, and all of this, now we need to learn how to live. So what role is children and nature going to play? How can we make that connection of the living memory that Rich Lowe was talking about? How do we make, like, I visited in Denmark this five-day summer camp. Only grandparents and grandchildren. How do we have skateboard parks where we got not only beautiful trees in the middle of the skateboard park, but also a nice cozy area for the grandparents so that they will come and bring their children. How do we have all these gardens being taken care of also by boomers and children? The children of all ages, they love to go to places with their grandmothers and their kids. All of this is about how do we want to live? So I want to end by asking you that we must think outside the box. There are some successes. The biggest success that I've seen is this. Look at this. 200, the red, the red is the people that live in extreme poverty. Less than $2 per day. Only 200 years ago, we used to have over 90% of the world population. Today, 40 years ago, when I was talking about the hard, 40 years ago, we had still over 75%. Three out of four people in the world live in extreme poverty. Now it's less than 10%. It's amazing in the last 40 years. So when we try to do something, we can do it. Of course, you know that these people are rich. Now they don't live under $2. But it's, and we still have about 800 million people, million people living in extreme poverty. So what are we going to do? So let me tell you about a couple of examples of good stories. This is the, funda the foundation, Mi Parque, my park in Chile, that has gone into really poor areas and transformed these parks. They've done 256 parks as of last week. And the last time that I visited them, they were painting some of these and bringing nature. Here in Canada, the Trans-Canada Trail, from sea to sea to sea, thousands of kilometers, over 16,000 kilometers, interconnecting the whole country. I was working in Mexico when they were, the government said, okay, we're gonna get rid of this oil factory. 
That was 10 years ago. They forced the oil company to clean it up, over $100 million, and now the children are connecting with nature. When this elevated railroad in New York, all of the sudden what, people didn't know what to do with it, and they, to we turn it down or what, and they created the Highland Park. It's bringing nature to people, so the issue is not the cities. How are we going to bring nature? Turning roads into parks. This used to be six lanes of cars 10 years ago. And now they created a linear park of one, almost two kilometers long, more than a mile. In Seoul, they used to have this elevated highway, and they wanted to do a third floor. They tore it down, and they created a linear park. These are the kind of things that we must do if we want to create cities for people, if we want to connect the children and nature. Portland, Madrid, Spain. So imagine, now with the driving this car, I think with the driving this car, we might end up having many more cars on the streets. But we might have a lot fewer cars in the parking. We need to reposition nature because a lot of those parking lots in Houston and everywhere else have to be turned into nature places, parks and streets. What a wonderful opportunity, but we need to start planting that seed in the minds of the decision makers. And everybody has to participate. We need to create more alliances. But not just between parks and environment people. We need to get involved the media and the business and the urban planning and the activists and public health. We need to grow the movement. And if we are going to grow the movement, children and nature, every time that people are talking about sidewalks or parks or density or cities or streets or education or anything, we got to be at the table. Because if we're not at the table, we are going to be on the menu. <laughs> And when, we, and when they said, what happened with that parking lot? We thought it was going to be a park. Did you go to the meeting? No. Did you make the phone call? No. Did you send email? Well, you were on the menu. So we need to develop that sense of urgency. We need to develop a shared vision. we got to move from talking to doing. I know that we are doing. We saw some images, but we got to do more. And we got to do it faster. Yesterday, I met with the people on Nature for All. What a wonderful initiative. Everybody has to support Nature for All. Here in Vancouver, in Vancouver said we want to be the greenest city. Not in BC, not in Canada, in the world. In the world. And they are moving in that direction. And look, it's not just the, here, it's economic development, the economic commission. So it's a broad alliance. And everybody's working on this. And it's transforming Vancouver in so many ways. And it's going to be helping. They're even planting trees on the top of the buildings. <laughs> and they put public art. Some of the older people read a book next to the public art. But the children, they love to play in the public art. That's all we need. When we put public art in the parks that we work kind of do. Canada, now we are celebrating 150 years, so people go to the parks, national parks for free. Why just when we celebrate 150? Let's make that a trigger to make sure that no one should have to pay to go to a park, ever. <laughs> that should be like a right. And then Singapore is making the city all green and parks. And London wants to create a national park city. And it's transformed.